Welcome to the Advantage series about exploring careers in the green economy. This episode is entitled Leading by Example in the State Government Putting P Climate Policy into Action. My name is Catherine and I'm in the class of 21.5. And I'd like to introduce today's guest speaker. Um, it's Eric Friedman. He's in the class of 82. Um, and he's the director of the Massachusetts Department of Energy Resources Leading by Example program. Thank you for joining us. Thank you, Catherine. It's great to be here with you. <clears throat> so this series explores a number of different professional areas involved in the so-called green economy. I was wondering if you could tell us a little bit about the program you lead, the Leading by Example program, um, and how it fits within whatever your idea of the green economy is. Sure. Um, so let me let me start by describing the Leading by Example program, and then I'll try and tackle that uh, second part of that question, which is a bit a bit broader and yeah. uh, a bit vaguer, perhaps. So the Leading by Example program uh, here in Massachusetts is an effort. So essentially, it's a greening the government effort. It works with all of state government, all of our agencies, uh, including our 29 institutions of higher education, all of our UMass campuses, our state colleges um, and universities, community colleges, and a variety of agencies that include uh, folks like our uh, prisons, um, transportation agencies, parks agencies, health and human service agencies, and uh, our uh, efforts range um, across a wide range of, of a portfolio. Um, so we have uh, 80 million square feet of buildings, thousands of vehicles, tens of thousands of employees. And of course, our facilities range from, you know, tiny little visitor centers or parks agencies, uh, park agency buildings to large hundreds of thousands of square feet uh, office buildings to, you know, a 10 million square foot uh, campus out in, in Amherst. So really runs the gamut. Um, and essentially, the program works with all of these institutions and all of these buildings and all of these people who work in these uh, in these facilities to try and reduce the environmental footprint of state government, which, as you can imagine by the, the description, is a pretty large entity within, within Massachusetts. Um, so, and I'm sure we'll get into a little bit more, more detail as we go, but uh, in the efforts that we uh, undertake with all of these facilities, we really are focused on essentially the green economy, um, which I think you know, can mean a lot of different things to a lot of people, but our efforts really are focused on uh, developing, implementing, managing green technologies, green strategies, um, green programs across this portfolio and across a range of issues. We tackle things like obviously energy consumption and greenhouse gas emissions. We look at uh, uh, efficient vehicles. We're looking at um, both new construction and existing buildings. We're looking at uh, waste management, water conservation, uh, landscaping practices. So all of those things are in essence, all of those efforts are in essence part of this green economy as we think about how do we move away from a fossil fuel based uh, economy, fossil fuel based civilization and move to, to alternative fuels, alternative technologies and alternative strategies that um, minimize or even eliminate impact on the environment. There are a few challenges for sure. Um, I think the key ones that I would highlight include um, technical solutions. So um, in some cases we know we can move a, a sedan to an electric vehicle, but in some cases there are certain types of vehicles that just don't exist as an electric vehicle. So if we have a need for a pickup truck or larger vehicles, and those vehicles are not available, that's a technical challenge that we can't just magically wish away and, and hope that um, it'll get better. I think those, those solutions are coming, um, but certainly right now there are some of those challenges. There are other technical challenges too, uh, related to um, how do we decarbonize our facilities? How do we completely eliminate use of fossil fuels? Um, we're pretty good at reducing our use and moving to cleaner fuels, but once you get to that, that last piece, which is to actually eliminate the use of fossil fuels, it can get pretty tricky um, and technically complicated. So that's one, one set of challenges, I think. Um, another important one, I think, has to do with economics. Uh, a lot of these strategies, a lot of these technologies um, can cost money. Uh, they're not necessarily well developed, and so some of them are in their infancy. Um, that means they don't have economies of scale, they don't have, you know, 10 or 
a hundred or two hundred years of, of of backing or of experience or of economies of scale here. So, um, so finding finding the capital, finding the dollars to uh, make these um, uh, make these technologies affordable is is definitely another challenge. And then lastly, I'll say I think and I think we all face this in all of the work that that we do and um, all of the the sort of new efforts that we're trying to implement. There is kind of a, a knowledge challenge, um, kind of a comfort challenge. People are used to what they're used to. They're used to driving a car and filling it up at a gas station. Yeah. They're used to windows working a certain way. They're used to um, boilers in the basement that use fossil fuels that come from the outside. And so when you start to change all these things and you change how things look, how things feel, um, and potentially sometimes change the way they need to be operated, then that starts to bump up against people's comfort zones. And so it takes a lot of education and communication to try and educate people on how these things work, why, why they're better, and how in the end they're going to actually prefer them. So like an electric car is a much more fun and much more enjoyable car to drive, but it does take some getting used to. There are you know, some challenges and changes that you need to adjust to. So I think those are probably uh, three of you know, what are, so it could be a long list of challenges, but those are, I think, yeah. the three key ones. And I think it's true to some degree that state governments obviously are limited by the revenue we take, we take in. Um, and that can be variable, right? It, it depends on the economy, it tends, depends on the tax, tax revenue. Obviously, right now, a lot of state governments are struggling after a year of COVID and economies being shut down either in part or in whole. Um, and so available resources are, are pretty limited um, right now. On the other hand, in state government, we have a much longer view, a much longer time horizon. We are not looking at making a profit in the next three years or five years. When we build a building, um, when, we, when we move into a building to, to you know, operate state programs, we're there for the, for the long term. Those buildings are meant to be there for 50 years or more. Um, and so what we do to those buildings when we build them have a very long-term impact that we will benefit from over, over the long, long term. In the private sector, it is true that sometimes they have more disposable income, but oftentimes because of shareholders, because of the way, um, the way their stock value is, is measured, um, they sometimes have a much shorter time horizon and so are often not looking at that 20, 30, 40 year horizon, but are looking at you know three, four, five, six, seven years um, to, to think about projects that will pay back in that time frame. So, so I think it's a it's a mixed bag and a complicated one. And I think there's some economic benefits to being in the public sector where we can really take the long view, but you're right that there are some some challenges in the the fiscal constraints that we have. Backtracking a bit, could you tell us like a little bit of the history of the Leading by Example program? Yeah, so the the program um, was formally established back in 2007. Um, That's what I, was, I thought, but I didn't want yep, to say. Uh, by, by an executive order back then under a previous, previous administration. Um, it really stemmed out of a number of efforts that were happening that were sort of disparate and um, housed in silos, uh, kind of in different agencies. We had people working on you know, recycling issues. We had people working on uh, construction issues. We had people working on some, some uh, toxics reduction efforts, um, but nobody was really kind of bringing them together and thinking about how do we create a holistic comprehensive program where state government is thinking about all of these things under one umbrella. Um, so that was really the, the genesis of this. And, and certainly back in 2007 was I don't want to say the beginning, but certainly um, was was when Massachusetts really took a great leap forward in terms of public policy, thinking about climate change, thinking about emissions, and thinking about clean energy policy. Um, that was when, for example, we moved all of the energy and environmental agencies under one umbrella, the first state to do so, actually. And so there was this recognition that uh, energy issues were not just about reliability. Um, or cost, but we're also about environmental concerns and about long-term um, emissions reductions. So, so this program really was um, in in step with some of those broader policies that were that were beginning 
in recognition of the importance of kind of bringing things together under um, under single programs. And do you know of any other state governments or other levels of government, maybe federal, that have programs such as this, which are more holistic, or is Massachusetts still sort of a pioneer in this area? Um, so I think the answer is a little bit of both. Uh, I think our program is somewhat unique in the sort of the breadth and the scale and the scope of the program. Um, also the, the longevity of it, uh, the fact that it's been around in, in this form for well over a decade. Having said that, there are lots of states and even the federal government that also have similar efforts, um, not under the last federal administration, but certainly under the, the Obama administration, there were executive orders directing federal agencies to meet certain uh, emissions goals and environmental goals. Um, and lots of states also have sort of gone back and forth, but have, have developed programs to coordinate efforts uh, within state state government to do similar types of things. In fact, um, sort of in a, a recent exciting uh, effort um, that we helped to, to start, the US Climate Alliance, which is a group of 25 states that have pledged to meet the um, goals of the Paris Accord, uh, just created a national leading by example organization and the idea is to bring together programs like ours on a regular basis so that we can share information, uh, share best practices, help each other um, understand what challenges pe uh, people have overcome and the strategies that they've used to do that um, and really try and help us sort of not reinvent the wheel um, and learn learn from each other. So. Um, so that's, that's, we just had our first meeting a few weeks ago, and that's a pretty exciting thing that we're part of. Now that the United States is as a whole, you know, back in the agreement, do you hope to see increased um, participation in this program? Um, so I think that there's um, important federal action, right, that will hopefully be happening under the Biden administration related to clean energy. Um, certainly, the administration has committed, I think, to pushing clean energy, pushing renewables um, as a as a really important strategy. Um, they've already started talking about electric vehicles in the federal fleet, and also trying to do what they can to promote um, electric vehicle charging infrastructure across the country, which is an important piece of that effort. At the state level, um, you know, I think it's going to vary depending on. Uh, the policies in those states. Um, many states have recognized the, the value of clean energy, both from an environmental, but also from an economic development perspective. And some states you know, are in different places and are prioritizing different, different types of policies um, that don't lend themselves to, to these types of efforts. So I think it's really gonna vary on a state-by-state -state yeah. basis. That's fair enough. Um, and what do you see the future of this what do you think the future landscape is going to look like in this field, this sort of niche of leading a state's efforts across the board? Well, I, I think it's important to recognize that, you know, we are just one, it may feel big sometimes to us. So it's, it's a lot of people, it's a lot of square footage, it's a lot of, you know, buildings, um, but we're really just one small cog in a much larger, uh, a much larger um, set of sectors, right? So segments of society that that all need to get involved. And when you start thinking about, you know, what those sectors are and what they look like, you realize sort of the the scale of this challenge, um, but also the scale of the the opportunity. And so these kinds of efforts, like you know, what we can call leading by example efforts, where we have people who are or programs that are uh, working to try and move kind of large entities forward can happen at multiple levels. And, and in fact, they are. So you have private corporations that have sustainability directors whose job it is, is to do exactly what we're trying to do with state government, right? Is develop greenhouse gas inventories, identify how to reduce emissions across the portfolio of whatever it is, factories, stores, <laughs> office buildings that, that that company administers and looking at supply chain issues as well. Um, you have people at colleges and universities who manage sustainability programs there or who are energy managers. And of course, their job is to do exactly the same, um, same kinds of things that we're doing at the state. 
And you have people in many, many, many municipalities across um, uh, Massachusetts, but across the country that are also doing similar types of efforts. So, so I think this leading by example effort really is more than just you know doing this at state government. It's doing this across both private and public sector uh, entities. And really there's no end to where these kinds of jobs, these kinds of efforts can take place because we need these people in all of these, yeah. all of these efforts. Um, it's too much to ask, I think, this is my personal opinion, to ask the people who already have full-time jobs to all of a sudden become experts in alternative energy and in sustainability yeah. practices, right? So the, the reason you create programs like ours or establish sustainability directors at colleges is because they need to have a go-to person or a go-to program that can really coordinate all of this information and help the broader uh, entity, the broader organization take advantage of them. Do you ever try to think about what's the next thing after that? I mean, cause you know, 10 years ago it was fuel conversion. Did you expect that this is gonna be the next sort of phase or I don't it's very hard to predict the future you know we do know that there's a lot of work being done on innovative solutions um we know that you know electric vehicle manufacturers and battery technology is improving rapidly um we also know that there are lots of people doing research into that next generation of batteries so that you know batteries will get a thousand miles to a charge or you know can just be swapped out at a gas station in five minutes and you get your next 500 miles or so there's lots of sort of efforts underway which one of these is going to become the solution um that's cost effective and that works within this you know the sort of infrastructure we have it's really hard to to predict yeah. so so we do keep these in mind um <clears throat> you know we're hopeful that we'll be able to find a gas product that's made from 100% renewable sources, but we also recognize that that may not happen at the scale that we need. And so we need to have other solutions that are realistic and exist now um, because we can't depend on these technologies or these strategies to become successful necessarily. Yeah, and speaking of being go-to people and having experts, can you speak more to what your role is exactly, like specifically? Um, so I, I direct this program. We have a relatively small staff. Um, we all kind of carve out different uh, pieces within the program. Um, but my job really is to kind of help set direction for the program, to help identify priorities, um, to uh, help, ident help identify and understand you know, how, we, how we leverage the resources out there in the most effective way possible. Um, so that we're getting as much done as, as we can. Um, my job is to help establish kind of goals and targets um, and develop kind of the broad-based strategies on, on how, you know, we think we're going to get there. That was a great answer. I mean, because it sort of brings me to my next question, which is what aspects of your Middlebury experience do you feel prepared you for your work? This notion of critical thinking, right, on, on how to how to sort of think carefully about information that you're getting and not just either take it at face value, but really understand how to ask the right questions. What information do I need to know in order to not be an expert in everything because that's impossible to, to do, um, but to be enough of an expert, to have enough knowledge so that I can actually um, you know, work with, with people to understand an, enough of this issue um, so that we can, figure out how it best fits into what we're trying to to accomplish. Again, this critical thinking capability where um, talking through things, um, understanding kind of the basic concepts, um, and really utilizing information from from many different parts of your life to um, uh, to, to push the push these programs forward. You know, I think there's a notion here that oftentimes people think like, oh, if I'm just an expert in something or if I'm the smartest person in the room, I'll be able to get things done. But there are so many sort of intangible, um, I think, skills that one can learn at places like Middlebury or, you know, other institutions like that, yeah. that are really important. How do you talk to people that aren't like you? How do you understand 
um, different viewpoints, right? Of people that are coming from either different backgrounds or different knowledge sets or have different goals or have different roles in, in, in their work. Um, how do you communicate complicated information in a way that's easy to understand? Um, how do you communicate that information in different ways to different people who care about different things? Um, we do the same presentation sometimes to you know, an agency commissioner, and then we have to take that, that presentation and do basically present on the same issue to a facility manager or a CFO, and we have to change the presentation because the issues are not the same. They care about different things. So yeah. those are some of the sort of intangible um, skills and capabilities, I think, that, you know, in a place like Middlebury, where you're really being exposed to so many different viewpoints and so many different people can really can really help um, to frame these these um, sort of different perspectives that are so helpful. At Middlebury, you majored in political science, which is not exactly what you ended up, you know, making your career in. So could you please... You know, tell us your story from campus to career. Yeah. Um, so I have pretty much spent my entire career um, with a couple of very small exceptions um, since graduating um, from Middlebury in the public sector. Um, starting in New York City government, um, started, I was working for uh, a number of different city council members, got my feet wet on what it meant to operate a local um, a local politician's office, uh, did a lot of constituent work, uh, helping people with things like, you know, uh, traffic lights that are out or street lights that are, you know, all flickering on their corner or trash that didn't get picked up, sort of that constituent services piece. Um, and then moved on to work in kind of the more of the policy arena um, for another city council member getting, so getting a better understanding of how, how budgets are made, how policy is made, how legislation uh, kind of moves through the, the, the process. In all of that, I realized that um, environmental issues were the thing that I really cared about. And so I went to graduate school um, up here in the Boston area at Tufts, um, got a graduate degree in environmental policy. And then pretty soon after that moved into working for state government here in Massachusetts. And I've had a couple of different roles um, in state government, but have essentially been here ever since working for the state of Massachusetts, um, trying to create and move forward kind of some new new environmental um, efforts. Um, so I think, uh, so that's kind of the, the nutshell pathway. Um, I, I think that political science, although it doesn't seem all that related is actually pretty um, pretty connected yeah, to the not. work that I do, whether whether it was in the you know local politician's office or even in just kind of a policy office, because I think politics is really more than you know just sort of elected elected politics or elected government. It's really the art. Politics for me is really the art of you know how do you think, how do you get things done? Um, how do you understand um, the process for moving from policy to implementation. And, and so pretty much all of my career, certainly after graduate school has been all about that, is how do you take sort of policy directives, policy ideas, and how do you make them real? Because I will, if there's one thing that anybody takes away from this interview, it should be that policy is great and we need good policy, we need good laws, but the best law in the world doesn't get you anywhere unless people know how to actually take that law and implement it in the real world. And so most of the work you know, that we, we do, certainly in our program, is how do we take climate policy? How do we take um, environmental policy? How do we actually help people take those ideas and on the ground, get them implemented in our buildings, in our cars, in our facilities? And I would, I would venture to say that that's the hard part. Like the policy is great, we need it, but we can all sit around and come up with some great ideas as to what we think the world should look like. And then we can write that down on paper. How do you make that into reality? I think that's, that's the tough part. What, do you think that getting an advanced degree was very important in your field? So I do think it's, I, I do think it's relevant and I do think it's important. Um, I will say that one of the things that benefited me was 
having real world experience before I, I went back to, to graduate school. That's certainly a recommendation I would make. Um, I took, I forget what it was now, like nine years between, you know, graduation and, and um, from Middlebury and, and going to, to graduate school, maybe it was 10. Um, I don't know that people have to certainly have to do that much, but I do think that having kind of this understanding um, on how the world works, that it's not, um, it's not the same as what you learn in school, that the, yeah. the real world is different from kind of the academic experience. That was really helpful, I think, when I got to graduate school and, you know, again, tried to, to focus on um, the issues that I, that I really cared about. You know, there are a number of jobs that require graduate degrees. And so that's certainly um, a reason to, to do that. But I think there's really, if I'm, we hire, you know, a lot of people in our office and certainly in our program, I've hired a number of people over the, over the years. You know, I would much rather um, have someone who's had some real world experience even tangentially related um, than just having a graduate degree. Graduate degrees yeah. are great, but I really need someone who also understands like how offices work and you know just what are the dynamics in a in a workplace. Just even basic basic things like that are really important um, because pretty much everything we do in our office is all about teams and and collaboration and coordination. Um, and so I want people who understand that and who. Um, have that experience and can can you know bring that that skill set. Um, what advice would you give students in regard to getting your career started, getting your first job? How, how did you get your first job? So my 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 job paths have always been a little bit um, a little bit uh, interesting. Um, in general, I have um, kind of created opportunities by meeting people outside of work and kind of using those resources or leveraging those resources to yeah. either learn about a job that I would never have learned about um, or get sort of a, a leg up, right, on a, on a job that was, that was coming. Um, so just as an example, I um, almost right after college in Middlebury, I volunteered, I was interning at um, uh, a magazine in, in, in New York while I was job searching um, and I volunteered for then gu a gubernatorial race. And I happened to meet someone volunteering. We got, we became friendly. He then told me about a job with this council member who, councilman who I went to work with as my first job out of, out of college. And so it was kind of a seamless process. I didn't spend, you know, I wasn't pounding the pavement. I wasn't sending out resumes. It was really meeting this person who I developed a relationship with, who then told me about this job and then recommended me and, so sort of became kind of a pretty seamless process. And that's happened a number of times where um, just kind of networking and working with, you know, people interning in the right place, um, using um, graduate school uh, projects to uh, help develop some expertise that then led to my first job with the, with the state. That was sort of a, an experience that, um, I found it was very relevant to the job description. Um, and so um, that was very helpful in, in getting that job. So that's a long-winded way of saying that, you know, it's not just about, um, again, your knowledge or your coursework, but it's also getting, getting yourself out there, um, meeting people in your field, trying to build up your resume. I, I, you know, it doesn't almost matter with what, but certificate programs, um, internships, volunteer volunteer efforts, just demonstrating that you know you're doing more than just sitting in the classroom taking classes, which again is really important. It's hard to do, you know, as a college student. That's what many people are doing, but it is, I think, really important to get yourself out there, um, yeah. and and sort of demonstrate that commitment to to the work that you're interested in, but also bring that some of that extra experience beyond the academics. Yeah, and you you mentioned certificates. I actually had a question. I'm are there any specific skills or certificates that you would really recommend for students to learn? I mean, anything that you think that everyone's going to need to know in the future, like is it SATA, Excel, stuff like that? Well, um, so I, I will admit I'm not, I mean, certificate programs, I'm not really familiar with all that many. I think skills, though, I think absolutely data is absolutely key. Almost everyone on my staff um, 
is in some way using data to, to further their work. Um, yeah. In fact, we have a full-time data person. So, so one of the staff people that works for me basically manages all of our data. And so she literally spends almost full time just dealing with data and data analytics and data collection and data massaging. And so it, it is really important to all that we do, but everything we do, like wh whether it's an analysis, writing a memo, doing a presentation, data is front and center in how we frame that presentation or frame that issue and also how we how we make those presentations. So for sure, I would definitely um, encourage folks to become well-versed in data, whether that's Excel, well, certainly Excel, because that's what everybody uses, but there may be, you know, there are other um, uh, other ways to become expert in that as well. I also think, you know, and again, I'm speaking from personal experience um, about the, the programs that we run, but certainly things like public speaking, um, being able to speak in front of groups, being able to speak to different people um, and communicate effectively can be can be helpful, can be really important as well. Again, there are jobs where you work in a lab or you work in the field and you don't have to talk to people, but there are many jobs, in fact, pretty much all of the jobs in the policy sector, right, where you're going to have to be communicating effectively, talking to lots of different people. And so that's a pretty important skill as well. And then I do think that presentation skills are becoming more and more important. Um, <laughs> the memo has sort of gone by the wayside in our life and PowerPoint has become kind of the, the go-to way in which we communicate policy, commu message our programs, um, uh, you know, present information to, um, to the people that we need to present, present it to. Um, and I certainly know there's other um, programs besides PowerPoint, but, but presentation skills, I think, um, uh, can be important. And I wouldn't have said this, you know, a year ago, but understanding technology and understanding the, the different ways in which we now use technology to communicate with Zoom each other. Go. And then, you know, we, we hold a lot of meetings on, on Zoom, on GoToWebinar, we use Microsoft Teams. And so understanding not just how to use them, but also how to be creative with them, trying to bring innovative ways to to make these meetings less tedious <laughs> and less less you know boring and and not feel like they're going on forever how to mix them up how to engage people on a screen it's hard it's it's not an easy thing to to do but you know if people can start to really learn those skills and learn those techniques i think that's going to be helpful because clearly we are our world is changing and many of us are going to be working from home a lot more than we ever thought we would be um, Eric, thank you so much for uh, joining us, taking the time to speak with me and to everyone who watches this. I'm um, just helping students prepare for their first career in this uncertain time, to say the least. Um, so this concludes our episode within the Midvantage series that is exploring careers in the green economy. Um, just a reminder to viewers that if you want to watch more of these to get career perspectives and advice, I'm from a number of alumni professionals in a broad variety of organizations. Um, you can go to the events and programs tab on the CCI website. Thank you for watching. Thanks, Catherine.